So, let us continue with our investigation into Xi and before I dive into this a little more, let us first clearly understand what we out want out of Xi. As we know that that uh, Xi Z is Z, Z minus 1 pi to the minus z by 2 comma z by 2 zeta z. Our eventual target is to estimate log no zeta prime over zeta. So, we do this take the log and differentiate we get xi prime over xi equals 1 by z plus 1 by z minus 1 minus log of pi by 2 plus And therefore, if you look at zeta prime z over zeta z in absolute value, that is bounded by of course, gamma prime z over 2 or gamma z over 2, which is which we already know is like order log of z. Again, in the range we are interested in, which is sort of up there. Right, so it works fine. And the first three quantities here are tiny, so they got all absorbed into order log z plus xi prime over xi. So that's so that's the quantity we need to estimate. in the range where z varies from a little more than 1 plus i r to minus 1 plus i r. So, we already have done this job for gamma function estimating gamma prime over gamma through this first we showed that it is an entire function without any zeros. then we looked at 1 over gamma which is an entire function without uh, with zeros of course and then we expressed okay now entire function of order 1 and then we expressed 1 over gamma as a product which gave us an expression for gamma prime over gamma so that's the same approach we use for xi also we know that xi is an entire function we know that its zeros are precisely the non trivial zeros of zeta function the only thing we need to establish at this point is the order of this xi and xi is an entire function, but what is the order of xi? Now, for this, let's just recall the definition of xi. Okay, there are two definitions. One is through this product which we already have written here, but this does not give too much of a clue, because of course, gamma we know exactly the order of, but zeta we do not know the order of. So, instead of this we look at the other definition of xi, which is xi z is 1 plus z z minus 1 integral from 1 to infinity t to the z by 2 plus t to the 1 minus z by 2 w t d t o t. And here w t is this sum 
n greater than equal to n e to the minus pi n square t. Okay. So, knowing this as a definition of xi, can we estimate the order of xi? What does this give? So, order of xi means absolute value of xi is it we want to estimate. This is let us say less than equal to mod z square for this part and then integral going on to infinity t to the z by 2 what is that bounded with that is bounded by clearly t to the mod z by 2 right and t to the 1 plus mod z by 2. Okay then W t over t d t. Fine. Now, of course, there is a it is a sum. So, we can equal to therefore, write this as order with order you can always use equal to z square 1 to infinity t to the mod z by 2 W t d t. Okay. Because the first integral that is corresponding there is a sum the first integral is going to be less than or equal to second integral because it's a it has a big higher power of t here which then cancels out with this and then we get so we we want to estimate this quantity right and again it's not too difficult to estimate it actually if you look at this 1 to infinity t to the mod z by 2 wt dt just plug in the definition of wt sum n greater than equal to 1 e to the minus pi n square t d t. Now, here the we can exchange the sum with integral although both are infinite, but again using the fact that this quantity is uniformly convergent we can exchange the two. So, we will write it as n greater than equal to 1 integral 1 to infinity t t. Now, what do we do with this? That there is a simple way to handle this actually this is mod z is some real number right. So, let us this is at most 1 to infinity t to the whatever is the ceiling of mod z by 2 in integral the integral the integer just higher than mod z by 2 e to the minus pi n square t d t right and uh, now this this look familiar t to the integer e to the minus pi n square t d t is almost like the gamma function except that pi n square sitting in the up there. So, that we can get rid of very quickly when do a variable substitution. So, set u equals pi n square t. So, we get this is equal to n greater than equal to 1 when t goes from 1 to infinity this will go from course you can say 0 to infinity for u also gamma function is integral from 0 to infinity i think right gamma function integrates from 0 to infinity i think that's right so 1 to infinity i can always replace by 0 to infinity and put a less than equal to here and here you get u to the mod z by 2 divided by pi n square Now, just take everything out that you cannot integrate and this is now the gamma function 
which becomes 1 over pi n squared to the plus 1 and what is inside is simply the gamma of mod z by 2 plus 1 right which is of course has nothing to do with n so this is a common factor outside and we get this sum now what happens to this sum this converges right it's like your uh, you're summing up 1 over n with a certain power that power is more than 1 that is clear it is at least 2 more than 2. So, that sum is a bounded quantity right. So, this is whole thing is order gamma z by 2 plus 1 which of course, is order 1. Of course, I have not looked at this multiplication factor of mod z square, which does not change the order at all. Good. So, the moment we establish it, we can bring in the whole machinery we developed for analyzing the xi. what can we write xi as is xi 0 0 or is it is not I think right xi 0 is not 0 we already argue saw that. So, if there is no multiplier of z. So, this is like e to the a z plus b for some constants a and b then product which runs over all the zeros of xi which are precisely all the zeros of non trivial zeros of zeta function so we'll use the symbol rho to run over all non trivial zeros of zeta function so whenever i write product over rho implicitly it means is running over all non trivial zeros of zeta function so that's a good shorthand otherwise i need to write that every time and we'll not use the symbol rho anywhere else this is the only place we are going then 1 minus z over rho e to the z by rho All right. Now, that we have this product expression what is xi prime or xi that is easy. That is a plus sum over rho and minus 1 over rho here divided by 1 minus z over rho here plus 1 over rho this is what we get. So, again this is a familiar expression we saw already over gamma prime or gamma, <coughs> but of course the sum is over non trivial zeros instead of integers. <coughs> so, this is a little more difficult to analyze, but we already get some very interesting things. For example, if you recall we said that the entire function of order 1 in a radius of r is going to have at most how many zeros r to the 1 plus epsilon right we can throw the same result on this also so now of course we know that in this case the zeros only lie in that strip between 0 and 1 
So, at a height of r and that is the height we are interested in right, we are we are interested in integrating we are interested in this integral this is at r we are just interested in integral between from here to here so at height r and what we know is that in this region what's the maximum number of zeros order r to the 1 plus epsilon that is directly from this result. Of course, it is not useful, but still interesting to know that there is some uh, immediate quantity we can put to the number of zeros. Here. So, it is not something very arbitrary. Of course, we still do not know whether there exists infinitely many zeros here. Although I have shown this product, now this product is valid whether there are infinitely many zeros or finitely many zeros. So that's okay. But uh, we don't know if there are infinitely many zeros. In fact, it turns out that number of zeros at up to height r is is I think r log r plus some error term. So you can actually very precisely bound the number of zeros up to height r, but I will not prove that not not yet because it is not useful for us. Okay, so, coming back to this that is a sum we want to estimate and we want to estimate this sum when z has a specific re range of values. So, let us set some up things up let let us write z as for the range of values we are interested in as alpha plus i r because it is at the height r we are interested in and we know that alpha is between minus 1 minus 1 and 2 okay it is actually in between minus 1 and c and c is less than 2 so instead of writing c every time let us just write this and we also let rho which is a 0 as sigma plus i t and sigma of course, we know is between 0 and 1. So, with this notation fixed <coughs> let us analyze this sum a is constant. So, we can just hide it away in order 1. So, what we really want is to understand this sum. So, let us just consider this sum or sum over rho So, with the notation we just introduced we I can write this as And this again it is generally is easier if it get rid of the complex numbers from the denominator. So, let us otherwise summing this inverse of complex numbers there is very little intuition you can stick to this. So, let us just take this up using standard methods. Good. Now, let us look at this expression for a moment. The first part can you bound it not clear the t here 
can become in ever bigger as rho increases the mod absolute value of rho increases the value of t also increases. So, it is not clear whether this is going to get bounded, but if you just look at the real part of this the first expression is that bounded that is because sigma is always between 0 and 1 and sum over rho of 1 over absolute value of rho squared that is bounded why. Yeah, that has actually we proved this using this fact that the number of zeros is bounded. If you recall, we proved that for entire function of order one, if z one, z two, the z z i's are its zeros, then sum over i one over mod z i to the one plus delta is bounded. So certainly one sum over 1 over sum of 1 over mod z i squared is bounded and this is what exactly what is happening it is summing over all zeros of this entire function of order 1 and 1 over this. So, if you just look at real part of this that is equal to this is order 1 plus here what can we say again we can forget about this complex part alpha minus sigma this is at most 2 because alpha is between minus 1 and 2 when the I have already specified the range we are interested in and sigma is between 0 and 1. So, this is at most 2. to alpha minus sigma for the moment plus r minus t squared. Actually, I will be wanting an upper bound here. So, I want to replace this yes that is fine I want to replace this with a quantity which is now greater than this. Okay. Okay, so let us keep it that way. So, what we get out of this is therefore, that if we put everything together all of this all the way, then what we get is sum over rho alpha minus sigma and let us take the absolute value here by Now, this of course, the, this part is small, this part is small. So, what eventually we are getting here is sum all all zeros and then inverse of r minus t whole squared that sum right and where t is the imaginary part of all the zeros. What is gone? I am only looking at the real part. Real of this, real part of this is equal to this, right. So, this is at most the absolute value of this, okay. The real part of this is real of A plus real of this, right. So, I can say that real of this is real of xi prime over xi plus con order 1 right a is fixed and that is also equal to this. So, I can say this sum is equal to real of xi prime over xi plus order 1. Now, the real part of xi prime over xi is less than equal to absolute value of xi prime over xi. So, I am getting an interesting sum here on the left hand side which tells me about an upper bound on the behavior of inverse square of the complex parts only the complex parts of the 
only the complex part of uh, the zeros of course i know that this converges that we know anyway inverse of imaginary part inverse of squares of imaginary part will converge because the real part is anyway bounded so it's going to converge but with this analysis i can actually de derive a relationship about with this sum and the quantity that it converges to and the quantity will clearly depend on r because that's the only parameter here everything is being summed over right so that's what the target is so for in order to achieve that we need to get a bound estimate on this but that was the original problem anyway so what what have we solved well the nice thing is that this relationship is available or is uh, true for all values of alpha right alpha remember varies from c to minus 1 and for all values of alpha this is available in fact forget about c when if from 2 to minus 1 it's if i vary it's available okay and when i set alpha equals 2 then i know everything because at that z that is which is 2 plus i r i can bound zeta prime over zeta i can bound gamma prime over gamma and therefore i can bound xi prime over xi because after all what is xi prime over xi is here that is xi prime over xi once i stick in z equals 2 plus i r this is order 1 so let me just put that in black and white for z equals 2 plus i r zeta prime over zeta is order 1 and hence xi prime over xi is order log of z what is the order log of z it's log r right so all together we get 2 minus sigma in absolute value square is order log r okay now i just want to simplify this expression a little bit so all i will do is i'll replace this expression with something which is smaller than so that smaller expression will continue to satisfy this equation and to make the quantity smaller what I will do is I will make the numerator smaller and denominator bigger. What is the smallest value that this can take 2 minus sigma 1 because sigma varies from 0 to 1. So I will replace this by 1. What is the largest value that 2 minus sigma can take 2. So I will replace this by 4. And to make it even simpler, I mean these are trivial uh, stuff. I will get rid of this four also. How do I get rid of this four? I will multiply this by with four, so that becomes bigger. So this becomes smaller, and then take this four this side. this is going to be a very very important relationship for us because this is giving us something very interesting let let's pull out again that diagram
let us look at this region. Many zeros will lie in this region, possibly between t and t plus one. T is an integer, some t and t plus one. Okay. This expression is going to give me a value to how many those zeros can, maximum number of zeros can be. How? Just substitute for r capital T. Then every single zero in here. So what I know is this sum is order log t. Okay. So, every single 0 in this region of course, will be counted by this will be will contribute something to this sum will contribute everything is positive here. So, everything adds up we will contribute something to this sum what is that quantity is going to contribute a 0 in this region. This is simple. At least how much? What? R no, R is capital T. So the, I know that this sum, one plus inverse of one plus t minus small t whole squared, is order log of capital T. And this sum is over all the zeros all the way up. So in this region when the rows are in this region pick pick any one of these rows it will have some value of small t what is that value of small t it's going to be between capital t and capital t plus 1 so whatever that value is if you plug that in here this is capital t this is something between capital t and capital t plus 1 what is the minimum number that you get the maximum this difference can take is 1. So, this number the contribution of any of these zeros here will be at least half to this sum and all the numbers here are positive. So, the how many zeros can be here? At most order log t. There cannot be any more more than that because otherwise the sum will go beyond this. And this is true for any t. Okay. So, this tells us how to choose my r. Of course, I want to choose my r to be a certain around a certain value, but within that, see remember we wanted to an r so that to avoid any of these poles here because we cannot afford to integrate over a pole. Now that we know that there are at most log t zeros between t and t plus 1 we can conclude therefore, that there is there are at least two zeros. So, let us say t is the value around which I want r to be. So, what I do is look at this region I know that there must be a strip in this of horizontal strip of width about 1 over log t and there are no zeros in that strip. So, I will send my line or r choose r to be the middle of this strip just cut through like this which will guarantee that this line is away from any of the poles by a distance of at, at least order 1 over log t. Okay. So, that is what I am going to do eventually. So, this
ok. So, instead of writing the distance to be order 1 over log t I am just writing log 1 over log r because t is same t is r plus minus 1. So, that is makes no difference ok. So, that is the first thing we learned from this. Now, this was obtained only by looking at the real part of this and we ran away from the complex part because that was diverging and this was simpler to manage, but we still have are not done because we have still not been able to bound zeta prime over zeta when we have done everything except bounding zeta prime over zeta in that region. So, that has to be done and for that we have to get in upper bound on this quantity and the upper bound on this quantity for z varying from between you know, in this region. So, we sort of in this analysis we just said ok because we cannot vary z in this region let us fix z as 2 plus i r and we know that zeta prime or zeta is bounded there. So, I am they do not have to work hard but now I have to work hard. So, let us get back to this fortunately the hard work is not too much. So, we can manage it hopefully within this class let us see if we can ok. So, now after this let us come back to If I am not allowed to look at the real part of this, then this quantity 1 over rho itself becomes troublesome, because uh, it is not clear whether sum over rho of 1 over rho is bounded, actually it is not going to be bounded, which may not mean much, because this quantity which, which has some negatives they may it may cancel out things and then, then eventually they get to some sensible value and we know that it does get to some sensible value and it is bounded we just need to know what the upper bound is. But for the sake of analysis we cannot easily hack this. So, we employ another simple trick which is that we consider this quantity. So, we had we had that zeta prime over zeta oops that's equal to order log z plus this sum So, what we do is we it is a simple really cheap trick we already know we have used this actually that this is order 1 right and actually absolute in absolute value this is order 1 and this of course, satisfies this equation as well. So, So, we put all this together our target is to bound this zeta prime over zeta get derive an upper bound of zeta prime over zeta. We are going to use this, but this is hard to bound. So, all we do is we subtract zeta prime over zeta from zeta prime over zeta at 2 plus i r.
what is this equal to as order log r actually order log z here is also order log r because z is varying from minus 1 to c. So, it is always the real part is always bounded. So, this is always going to be order log r this is order log r this is order 1 and so plus the nice thing is that sum over 1 over rho and sum over 1 over rho cancels each other out here. So, what we are left with is this and since we know that this is bounded this is constant in absolute value. So, this is equal to order log r plus can just bound this in absolute value all right so the problem now is to bound this quantity so let's focus on this Of course, we are looking at the absolute value here. Mm. This is equal to we should say less than equal to. this is equal to z is alpha plus i r right, where alpha is a varying quantity. So, if you just stick that in your alpha minus 2 here alpha plus i r minus 2 minus i r. So, that cancels each other out the i r and Now, unfortunately, I will have to expand this also. So, what is this z minus p? We know that this is alpha minus sigma squared plus. r minus t squared square root or let us take square root outside. What is this part? That is simply the only change is 2 minus rho squared plus r minus t squared. Okay. Now, I need to get an upper bound. So, I will replace this by the smallest possible value of alpha minus sigma what is that 0 get throw it off. What about this 2 minus sigma it is not 0, but assume it is 0 throw it away and this 2 minus alpha I need to replace with the the largest value 2 minus alpha largest value is 3. That is much simpler expression. Okay, so, now we are very close actually. So, if you see this is this familiar we just derived something similar to this where was it yeah it is here 
that sum over all rows 1 over 1 plus r minus t whole square is order log r ok. So, that is giving us a good upper bound. What we have here is 3 forget the 3 1 over r minus t whole square the only thing missing is 1 plus here, but for this we would have had our upper bound very neat order log r done, but we are not too far off because this I can write as again cheap tricks 6 pi. 2 r minus t whole squared, which is less than equal to okay, which I will break as some more rows such that r minus t is less than equal to 1. Plus some more rows such that absolute value of r minus t is greater than 1. Okay. And this we can bound. See, because absolute value of r minus t in this sum is bigger than 1, two, twice r minus t I can surely replace by 1 plus r minus t whole square and lesser value. So, this is an upper bound and this is a sum over all rows actually except for a few zeros, but we know that even if you sum up over all zeros this is bounded by Order log. Okay. Now that leaves out this sum, but this is a sum only over finitely many zeros. It's like r is there, so just r plus one and r minus one. In that strip, whatever the zeros are, we are summing over those, and this is the quantity we want to sum over. And this is where the choice of r plays a role. I just fix the r. Right? R was to be chosen so that it is away from every 0 by about order 1 over log r. What that translates to in terms of this t's represent the 0, t's represent the height of zeros, and r is the height where we cut that region and that height is away from all the t's of zeros by order 1 over log r. So, r minus t therefore for all t's in this is at least 1 by log r some constant by log r right and since this is in the denominator i can replace this quantity by r minus t by 1 by log r right okay so what we get here is Order log square r, okay, and of course this quantity has nothing to do with the sum. So we are just summing over all the zeros in that strip. How many zeros are there in that strip? Order log r. So this is order log cube. That's it. We have bound zeta prime over zeta in that region by cutting across it. So now I'm done. Therefore, the integral as we went along uh, from c to minus 1 c plus i r to minus 1 plus i r of zeta prime over zeta d z by z d z. This is bounded by zeta prime over zeta I can replace by order log cube of r 
x to the z is uh, replaced by absolute value of x to the z which is x to the real part of z. So, I will just I do not want to mess with this. So, I will just replace with x to the alpha mod z is at least r. So, I can divide this by r safely and we have d alpha d z is same as d alpha. So, this is order log q bar times the or divide by r of course, here yeah, times the integral going from c to minus 1 x to the alpha d alpha. And this is of course, familiar we know that this is equal to order log q bar by r x to the alpha would integrate to x to the alpha by log x right and then we have going from c to minus 1 so we get x to the c by log x plus 1 by x log x and now use the value of c, c was 1 plus 1 over log x. So, this is actually x, x to the c is essentially x, the constant gets hidden away and this is clearly bigger than this. So, I can throw this away also. So, this becomes order x log q bar divided by and this quantity is going to be bigger okay let's I'll now I have to really go back well in the past now some one of you will have to dig that up what was the original equation derived of psi x psi x is yeah that is right, but this we estimated to be uh, is integral uh, c minus i r to c plus i r and I think there was 1 over 2 pi i also somewhere zeta prime z over zeta z x to the z by z dz plus order the question is what is the error no no, no we, we simplified that x log square x by r that is what we had and now we know that this integral this is equal to x now I'll pull out this x minus uh, what was it this is the residues at all zeros all the residues all the poles. So, there was a residue at pole x z equals 1 which was x one pole at z equals 0 that was zeta prime over zeta 0 that is order 1 forget that. Then there were residues at all negative and in integers what were the residues and there was a sign there also.
I think it was like x to the minus 2 m by 2 m. Now, I do not remember the sign whether it was plus or minus, it was plus hmm? okay. plus and then there is a then there is a negative right sum over all rows x to the row by row. And the error terms now. What are the error terms? So we had these three error terms. Uh, the integral from minus u plus i r to minus u minus i r that vanished, went to zero because we have sent u to infinity. So that just leaves two integrals: uh, minus one to minus u. What was that integral? We estimated this last time. It was something like uh, r to the one minus epsilon was there somewhere. Let me let me pull this out. So, as long as uh, r log x is common, so as long x as uh, x is bigger than r to the epsilon over x, which means x square is bigger than x is bigger than r to the epsilon by 2, this is going to be bigger than this. But anyway, let us keep this in. So, now we put this here, what do we get? Psi x equals I think this is one over two pi i also. Yeah. Just take this out and push shove that in here. We get x plus by the way, this is familiar. What is this quantity? Sum over m greater than or equal to one x to the minus 2 m divided by 2 m. Just differentiate this quantity, this sum, what do you get? You get sum over m greater than or equal to 1 x to the minus 2 m minus 1 and what is that sum? Okay, okay, okay. Let's let's take this out. Okay, let's okay, maybe we don't need to differentiate. Let's just take this. Let's just write this as half of this familiar to you? Anyone? What is log of one minus z? Or log of 1 minus y, let us not talk about that. log of 1 minus y. It is sum of m greater than or equal to 1 y to the m by m, right? And that is precisely what this is. So, this is equal to half of log of 1 minus 1 over x square. And there is a minus also here. There is a plus here, so there should be minus. This plus, this minus. Log of one minus y is minus of some m greater than or equal to one y to the m by. So this actually is a well-known quantity. So I can replace this with minus of log. minus x to the row by row plus all the errors. What are the errors add up to? This plus this.
that is the original one x log square x by and I need to minimize this error. So, what is the quantity at which this error is minimized? So, my only parameter of control is r, I need can choose my r to be just about anything. Of course, whatever value of r derived from here eventually I will have to perturb that slightly in that band of t and t plus 1 to reach the right avoid the all the zeros, but that does not affect the error because it is a very small perturbation. So, what is the minimum value of this expression for what r does it achieve r equals infinity. Oh course at r equals infinity this is this is 0. So, but what happens ok let us see what happens. So, this certainly implies that psi x equals x minus half oh I have been making a mistake here at least here I made a mistake. This sum over rows is only for t less than equal to r actually minus r less than equal to t less than equal to r because that is the region we are integrating and of course, we can send r to infinity and and derive this. an exact formula for psi x is precisely this. Now, the first two expressions are well understood, the last one is not well understood, but this also shows that this very starkly that the distribution of primes is dependent on the distribution of zeros of 0 to zeta function, the non trivial zeros of zeta function how they are distributed is what determines, but this is a unfortunately not very good in terms of estimating psi x. Okay, this is a nice formula, but what about this quantity what what can we say about this quantity it is an infinite sum first of all and secondly there is a row sitting here which is in 1 by row. So, I cannot even say that this is bounded if there was a power of rho which and it is worse than that there is x to the rho in the in the numerator. So, that is all of these put together do not make this expression useful this is a very nice and interesting expression, but it is not useful expression. In order to get a useful expression we need to limit r to certain limited or bounded value, then we can get an error bound on this. So, this is of course, a trade off between what value of r we choose. See suppose we just add up all the all of these quantities in the worst case they will all actually they will not get added up, but let us say assume in worst case they all get added up. What is the maximum contribution from 1 x to the rho over rho? Well, this would be uh, see x to the rho will contribute square root x maximum. Oh no, so what am I saying? X to the rho is going to contribute. See, the real part of rho is between zero and one, right? So, if the real part is one, then in the real bad case, this can contribute something odd, like odd omega x and if it does contribute omega x then the first two expressions are sort of meaningless actually second one is anyway meaning second one is order 1 x is always going to be bigger than 1 and log of 1 minus 1 over x squared is very close to 0 as x increases this actually goes to 0. 
so it is actually redundant only the first one is important if the real part of rho is 1 it might actually some of the such rows can get together and cancel out this x here and then we do have no clue what psi x going is going to be on the other hand if these are going to be smaller than length 1 then uh, we can say that maximum contribution say if uh, my real part of rho is uh, sigma which is what we had assumed then the maximum contribution this can make is x to the sigma divide by of course some absolute value of rho but that if that is small then x to the sigma is the maximum contribution this will make right. but uh, then the smaller the sigma is the smaller the contribution from this quantity is what is the smallest value the sigma can take of course zero if the sigma takes value zero then the contribution here is zero that's the best case but that is also the worst case because if there is a sigma equals 0 by symmetry there is 0 at sigma equals 1. So, this sigma is going to give 0, but that sigma is going to give x. So, you gain nothing. So, taking sigma below half does not gain you anything because symmetry gives you bigger sigma on that side. So, at sigma equals half is when this contribution will get minimized and if all sigmas were at sigma equals half all rows were at sigma equals half then this contribution will globally will be minimum to this quantity and that will be around square root x right. But if that is so that is a very rough analysis to say that the, this error introduced by this in the best case will be about square root x, but then we have to look at this error okay. how much is this going to be. Okay. So, let us try to estimate all of this. So, what I am going to do is uh, before estimating all of this let us just now we can already fix the value of r because anyway the error going introduced by this quantity is going to be about square root x and also notice that the bigger r is the more there is error because the more of these terms are there. So, you want to keep r as small as possible to reduce the contribution from this, but if I make if we make r too small then this central error blows up. But and now since we know that r is uh, the error is going to be a square root x. So, looking at this x by r x by r it makes sense to fix r to be square root x there about right. If you fix r to be square root x this contribution is also about square root x okay. and that is what we are going to do. We get psi x equals x minus and we are now going to throw this away the second term because that is pointless. And what happens to this term? This becomes square root x log square x. This is can be safely ignored, and this becomes square root x log square x. So both of these actually terms match. So that also shows that you can. This is the best you can achieve in terms of choice of r when you want to choose it around square root x. Okay, now, we come back to the Riemann Abbey. So, this all this analysis was done by Riemann. I mean everything that I have shown you today more or less was done by Riemann and it has taken me what 20 odd lectures to do that which he did in of course, 11 pages very densely packed of course, he skipped lots of things which were obvious to him which are not so obvious to the rest of the world. But uh, now, at this point is where Riemann made this hypothesis.
for all rows real row is half that is the alternate formulation equivalent formulation. And the reason was to minimize the error here, because at if all the zeros are at that line contribution of this sum to the error is minimum. So, what is the contribution? Let us just add up everything up. What is x to the rho? x to the rho is absolute value of x to the rho is square root x, assuming Riemann hypothesis, of course. So, it, all this calculation is now assuming Riemann hypothesis. Then, absolute value of rho. absolute value and now we take the sum of this from minus r to plus r t going from minus r to plus r 1 over absolute value of rho. This we can do in many ways one of the way we can do is to we just derive we derive that in one band of height 1 there are going to be only log t many zeros. So, if we just take that in here so, I just replace this by summation. So, by the way, there is symmetry around the real axis also of the zeros that follows almost trivially. Okay, why is this symmetry along zero? Let me write this down. Okay, we had this right psi z which whose zeros are precisely non trivial zeros. So, if z is a 0 what about z bar? z bar is a symmetric point down there right z bar would be z bars here t to the z bar z bar here right and now what do I why is that a 0? Well, because that is equal to xi z whole bar. Xi of z bar when you replace z by z bar everywhere is same as taking xi z and taking the complex conjugate of that. There is t to the z. Mm -hmm. So, t to the z you take this conjugate what would we have? t to the alpha plus i beta what is the conjugate of that split that t to the alpha conjugate is t to the alpha t to the i beta conjugate is t to the minus i beta. So, t to the z conjugate is t to the z bar. So, whether you replace z by z bar or take the bar of xi z the answer is the same and that is why 0 does it. In fact, that happens for any analytic function, forget about this, because any analytic function you can write when as a power series or something, and again the same argument applies. Okay. So, now coming back to this, so I can replace this is a, I can replace this with the order and some t from now uh, 0 or let us say 1 to r, because between 0 and 1 there are only finitely many zeros, so their contribution is going to be only finitely many, right. Finitely many in the sense some constant times square root x, right. So, we can that we can ignore and then we can just look at 1 less than equal to t less than equal to r, of course, square root x comes out 1 over absolute value of rho. Now, I can replace this by sum over t 
between 1 and r because how many rows are there in for between t and t plus 1 log t by absolute value of rho when rho is about t is how much rho, rho is a half plus i t what is the absolute value of this it is also about square root of something something which is around t right okay And how much is this sum now? Log t over t, t going from one to capital R. Well, it's surely log square r. Log t is upper bounded by log r, and sum over one over t, where t goes from one to r is most log r. So order x square square root x log square r. So, therefore, if Riemann hypothesis is true, then psi x equals x plus this is where we close this. Now, we have completely derived the analysis of Riemann and at the end this is what is psi x if Riemann hypothesis is true. If Riemann hypothesis is not true then psi x estimate gets worse because this error term then starts becoming bigger and bigger. Now, after doing all this you might believe that uh, you know we started from estimating psi x and gone all done so much and then eventually we showed this implication if Riemann hypothesis is true then psi x is there. And you might think that in doing such on this implication has such a long proof with so many steps that we will lose something that is lose something meaning that this if psi x equals this then Riemann hypothesis may or may not be true right because we have this is a very long implication right. So, it probably there is a good chance that we lose somewhere the equivalence and only have single direction, but surprisingly that is not true. If psi x equals this then Riemann hypothesis is true and that is a really simple proof I will show it next time.